Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Byington, and this is another T.S. Eliot video on his poem, The Wasteland. Um, this time we're talking about part two of the poem, A Game of Chess. So this setting of the chessboard, but it's kind of like um, the surrealism I talked about in one of the other videos uh, regarding this poem, um, that setting of a chessboard it's not just like one on a table. It's kind of like we are on the chessboard. Um, each of us is standing on our own respective square and all of this is happening. It's meant to kind of echo <clears throat> a sterile, like snooty, arrogant, upper class environment. Um, this is also where you might say that there's this sort of like cultural malaise in which nothing new is being reborn. It's like we're stuck. Um, another thing about this bit with the the game of chess, uh, so there is a reference here to uh, Middleton's Women Beware Women uh, that talks about a woman being seduced like through this series of actions as if it is like a game of chess. Um, this is also assumed to reference Eliot's own marriage. Um, his uh, In his marriage at this point, uh, upon writing this, or rather when it's published in 1922, he would have been married for seven years. And it's like really no secret um, in his bi biography that it was a really unhappy marriage. Um, <clears throat> there were issues of sexual dysfunction involving uh, him, whether we're, say we're saying it was like ED or like he just, he psychologically just couldn't be with his wife. Um, that's kind of like that Madonna whore thing that Freud talks about. Um, wh whatever the matter was, the, it's rumored that she had affairs on the side, but he allowed it because he couldn't bring himself to um, have sexual relations with her. Uh, th there are some different assumptions and, narr and narratives on that problem. But the overall uh, thing that is absolutely for sure is this was a really unhappy, spiteful marriage. Um, <clears throat> you also have a reference to uh, Cleopatra and also to Dido and Aeneas. If you're a student in my class, you know how that relationship turns out with Dido and Aeneas. And uh, you know, again, this would be kind of like reflecting uh, the, the marriage of the Eliots, uh, one that is, uh, it, it ends in tragic disappointment for the woman. Um, moving on, we have another one of those like jumping into another scene, another idea. Uh, you have what I describe as a paranoia or neurosis sort of segment. We have lots of different perspectives speaking at this point, and th there are just lots of questions. Some of these questions are about indecision, and that really also echoes um, the the writing tactic going on in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And it also echoes Eliot's repetitive use, not in this, not just in this poem, but in others, of uh, his fascination with Shakespeare and specifically Hamlet. And if you are familiar with the play Hamlet, you know that essentially you have uh, what would be a five-hour play if it if you don't edit things out for a performance. It's all about Hamlet being indecisive. He can't just buckle down and decide whether to murder his stepfather or not to avenge his biological father who was murdered by said stepfather. So uh, he was also his uncle, by the way. This mentioning of Shakespearean rag, it's uh, it represents a sort of degeneration of what was once this kind of formal, upper class, highbrow arts kind of thing. And it's kind of tumbled downhill and becoming all 
that has become muddy and corrupted, adulterated with popular culture. Now, in Uh, academia and scholarship now like we we totally embrace that we um look at what that says about culture now why you do in fact see shakespeare and his work everywhere and don't we don't look at it as like it's laughable that you see it in popular culture it's interesting that something that was once exclusively thought of as highbrow and uh, the elite studied shakespeare Uh, how that has bled into so many uh, outlets in popular culture. You also have the use of Shakespeare on throughout with, um, in the end, in the very last line of part two, I'll get to that in just a second. But um, <clears throat> when we go from, we have a transition from that chess, the game of chess, like a giant chess board, and we're all in this sterile upper class place. And then it's kind of like we went into this random space where it's just the voice is asking the questions. You can think of that as sort of like uh, the Sybil of Kumai, what I talked about uh, early in another video of her just being a voice, a disembodied voice trapped in the bottle. And Now we're changing settings again, and we're going to an East End pub, and we're overhearing a conversation that is, it's specifically written with the Cockney dialect. So, like, in My Fair Lady, it's the English accent that he's trying to make her lose, so she'll pronounce her H's and such, and... um Uh, sound like uh, a proper London lady. So we're hearing this conversation from the working class in an East End pub. The women are talking about uh, a friend whose husband has been demobilized. He's been uh, at war. He's been in the military for four years. And It says, well, he, he, get, he left her with money to buy herself dentures, to buy herself teeth, because apparently she does, hers have rotted out. And he told her she wasn't much to look at. And this friend who's talking to another friend, gossiping about the initial woman to her other friend, is saying, well, I told her she better buy those teeth or uh, he'll, he wants to have a good time when he gets back from war. And if you don't give it to him, he'll get it from somewhere else. Um, then... All the while that they are gossiping about this friend and also that she spent the money, apparently, for the teeth on um, an abortion. And she had previously had five other abortions. Um, all the while they're talking about this crude subject. Then the, the bartender is calling out for last call over and over while they are having that conversation. So... What you have is like, I usually describe it as layers when you have this, uh, you have the upper class and the lower class, but here he's really weaving that all into one space. And you're kind of looking at like, what is the next chess move? Um, it's important to look at these two different classes in society in this poem, because remember, that's essentially what, Uh, Elliot is asking you about at the end of part one and the burial of the dead. Like, well, what does this dead corpse on the battlefield, what does it point to? Where are we going? Okay, that's all for part two. Make sure you watch the other videos for the rest of the poem. Thank you for watching.